Patrick. Thanks, Dennis. It's been a long time since I've had an opportunity to talk to uh, fellow scientists and producers. Um, in fact, I was talking to Kylie before the presentation. This is the first PowerPoint I've put together in 23 years, George. <laughs> and believe it or not, it, it came back in about 30 minutes or so I, it, because it hasn't changed too much. So sometimes us old people, not changing is, is an okay thing. Um, it says on the head slide, Four Hands Holsteins is, is Rick and Gwen Dato, and Gwen is my wife. We have been at our current location for 23 years. Um, prior, now I'll, I'll share that a little bit later. Um, I do have quite a bit of uh, experience at the Forage Center and some other locations, uh, but we are really grateful for the opportunity to talk about what does happen at our farm. Um, it's not going to be unique amongst Forge producers. And like I was speaking to the gentleman earlier today, I think sometimes it's important for producers to hear what you maybe don't have to do rather than what you have to do. Because everybody tells you what you should be doing. And there's only 24 hours in a day, there's only so much time to get things done. And so, we are a little limited in some of our human resources at our farm, so we try to cheat as much as we can in certain areas. So I have the opportunity to express what we do, be it right, be it wrong, be it inadequate or too much. It's what we do, and perhaps you can take something away from it and, um, and, and ponder about it. I'd certainly like to hear your questions as well to find out uh, maybe we should be doing something different as well. So Four Hands Holsteins is comprised of Gwen and I and our four offspring. That's where the four hands came from. Whenever you start a dairy, you have to come up with a prefix for the Holstein Association for your cattle. And every one we picked, like Cobblestone and Unique Village or whatever, they were always taken. And so where do you come up with a prefix which is unique? Well, four hands hadn't been taken, so thus our Holsteins are called four hands. Uh, we have uh, our four children that participate in a limited basis on the farm. My one son comes every uh, other weekend or so to help relieve me. My daughter lives right down the road as a calf specialist, and she's been assisting my wife some on the calves as well. Um, the other two are... Uh, uh, teacher, one is a teacher and one is in graduate school at Texas A&M. I'm just proud that all four of our kids are currently involved in agriculture and it uh, sounds like they're going to stay that way. Our two full-time assistants are our two grandkids, uh, ages four and one, and they're there to help us every day. Along with that, we have eight full-time employees, um, and of course none of this is possible without them. I started my forage research at the Dairy Forage Center uh, at Madison, the, the sponsor of this program, um, as a master's student. At that time, I worked with uh, Dave Mertens and George Shook, who happens to be in the audience today. Thanks, George, for coming. Appreciate it. And at that time, we were looking at how to come up with feed costs associated with uh, milk production, specifically fat and protein, to calculate the net merit index, which was coming out at that time. Now, many people use net merit in dairy today, and uh, we were able to do a little bit in that area. After that, I served as a faculty member at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale for five years. I did some forage research there, and a few other types of research programs. Then I became a nutrition uh, consultant with a company in Michigan for two years and then received the invitation to return back to the farm for my wife's family's farm at that time in 2000. We were 36 at the time, and it was kind of like, well, you better blank or get off the pot if you're going to dairy farm. And so at 36, we decided to jump in with both feet and uh, become a part of, of that operation. Since that time, um, 
We uh, purchased the farm from my wife's parents in 2007 and thus became Four Hands Holsteins at that time. Um, my wife has a background as a high school educator in Reedsburg, Wisconsin. Also did some agri-science work in Michigan while she was there in Lapeer. And since then has been the adjudicator of the Four Hands when they were young and now is, uh, is with me full time and always has been full time as the chief financial officer and calf feeder on our farm. We are a full circle Holstein dairy farm. We have around 500 cows. They are all registered. Um, full circle meaning we have all the calves, all the heifers, uh, all the breeding heifers, um, and the whole gamut. Nobody gets shipped off the farm except the young bull calves. So very, very typical to most uh, smaller operations, at least in Wisconsin and I think in most of the upper Midwest. Our facilities uh, consist of several different freestyle barns, as you can see over here. Do you happen to have a laser pointer? No? Okay, well, we'll just keep pointing. Um, some of these barns are newer, some are older, um, but they all consist of sand freestalls, um, which I think is absolutely critical if you're going to take advantage of high forage quality. You have to have comfortable places for your cows. Our current RHA is around 31,000 with about 7.3 pounds of uh, uh, combined fat and protein yield per cow per day across the herd. Uh, those numbers, of course, go up and down. We're dealing with the fall time, so, so numbers are, are down a little bit, but, uh, but they, are, they are holding better than they used to, and I'll, I'll tell you why, and I think one of them has to do with forage quality as, as we get beyond here. We have about 1,500 acres of non-irrigated land uh, we grow a lot of alfalfa for our farm our size, about one acre per cow. Um, in a year like this year, Ted, it was sure nice to have the extra acres. We all know how dry it was in many parts of this state, and we were dry as well. We've been using brown midrib corn silage genetics for about six or seven years. We started with some of the hybrids that were a little agronomically inferior in terms of their yield and their disease uh, problems. Uh, the current hybrids that we're currently using are, are phenomenal. And I'll, I'll show you a few photos as we go on and you'll get a chance to see that. The remainder of the land is conventional corn silage for heifers, dry grain, and then of course, a little hay for the calves. You probably don't get an opportunity to hear too often um, from a, a scientist, a, uh, a school teacher, a farm owner, a herd manager, an agronomy manager, and a feeder. But, but I do all of those, or at least used to do some of those. But I currently do all of these, and I spend an awful lot of my time looking right here through the cab of that tractor out the front of the window. And so it gives you a different perspective about what you think forage quality is and what it could be, and really what you can actually control. Since I've been on the farm, you know, when we were in graduate school and as a faculty member, it was, it was all about this. We were seeking the truth. We wanted to find what was the answer. In the business world, we're over here. We have to go quickly. Economic returns have a denominator, and that's called time. So things have to go quickly based upon time. So speed is of, is of essence. So how do we balance quality and time with everything that we do, not only on the farm, but in our lives as well? And so we're still trying to seek that compromise. I sometimes get theoretical with people that stop by the farm, and uh, I like to share with them that our farm is really about the 80-20 rule, meaning that we try to get about 80% of the way there to perfection, if you will, on almost everything that we do. Because the goal of 100% is the return on investment, is the ROI. That's the most important number that we have to compare ourselves to others. 
But isn't it interesting that businesses never, re never share their ROI? You never see benchmarks for what the returns really are on farms. And so what we have instead are other benchmarks, things like forage quality and milk production and pregnancy rates and herd turnover and all those sorts of things. Those are very important things that contribute to ROI, but I can't be perfect at all of those. It would cost too much. George, I think about these data as a normally distributed set of data. And to get beyond the second standard deviation is extremely expensive. It takes too much people resources, too many inputs to hit that level. So if I can get that 80% on conception rates and on my forage quality, I think I'm doing pretty good because I try to hit all the buttons. Now there's a few items that are not 80-20. And those are things that my wife does. Calf care is 100-0. You cannot compromise on calves, at least we certainly try not to. Also, milk quality is not 80-20 because if you don't meet the standards, you can't sell your product. So when I see plate counts, PIs, all those go up, we have to squash that immediately. But I just wanted you to keep that in mind, the 80-20 rule. So there's a lot of things we do that are not 100%. So why is forage quality important, at least to us? Currently, our ration forages make up about 60% of the dry matter. So it's a little higher than maybe traditionally you might think 50-50. They make up about 45% of the crude protein. Of course, most of that comes from the alfalfa. One of the reasons why we feed so much alfalfa is to try to lower our supplemental protein costs as well. They contribute 83% of the NDF, but of course 100% of the long fiber. So forages have to be included in our diets. Why the quality is important is because lower quality feedstuffs limit intake. And intake drives nutrient digestion intake. I should mention that um, the award that we won last year was actually in a new category. It was, it's called the Quality Counts category. They have one for haylage and one for corn silage. So we won the corn silage category. And I believe that parameter is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, digestible. Uh, oh, it's changing. Oh, OK. Well, last year, it, it was uh, very equivalent to digestible energy intake. Is, is how I looked at it. So uh, starch level, starch digestibility, fiber level low, fiber digestibility high, um, contributed to, to, in, uh, to that particular. And because of that, it's the intake potential on those forages, which is really important and why we try to focus on forage quality. If you don't have forage quality, maybe you can substitute that with more digestible fiber sources, but there's a limit to just how much of that you can put in there, whether it's gluten feed, beet pulp, soy hulls. Secondly, it's very, or additionally, it's very expensive to store and grow these forages, so why not try to do a good job with what you've got? Another factor is, anti-quality factors can be devastating when you're talking about forages. I'm not talking about nutrient composition so much when you're talking quality here. I'm talking about things like mycotoxins and molds and yeasts, uh, excess moisture, um, uh, butyric acid. These are the anti-quality factors can, that can blow a, blow a herd up. If I ask producers here, how many of you have had cows that go off feed and you have no reason, you don't know why? The vet sells, tells you three pink pills and uh, call them in the morning. Well, most of the time you've got some little tweak in your corn silage somewhere or maybe a little butyric in your haylage. She got a bigger mouthful of it and now all of a sudden she's off feed. So these are the anti-quality things that we have control over that are important for us. And finally, like I mentioned before, as a milk producer and as a forage grower, if I'm going to milk these cows and grow this forage, I might as well do something pretty while I'm going through all the effort. 
I want to thank Dairyland Labs for sharing this information for, uh, for us. Um, I haven't, hadn't seen this. Anyway, these are our forage samples since 2014. Um, for In this case, these are halages. And uh, it, it, it gave me a chance to see where, where we're sitting compared to the rest of the Dairyland customers. The green line, there's four different uh, nutrient compositions here. There's moisture, crude protein, NDF, in NDF digestibility. Um, the all Dairyland average is the green line and the 25th percentiles are the dotted lines here. Um, and over the years, we tend to uh, produce haylage that's somewhere between 20 and 22 and a half, but you can see there's times when it varies. NDFs uh, tend to be a little bit lower than average on the haylages. NDF digestibility, which I was good to see, uh, tends to be trending to be increasing over time, although it's below the average of uh, Dairyland customers. So we have room for improvement there. On the corn silage, <coughs> our starch levels have been all over the place, and of course that depends upon grain yield in that, in that, in that forage. Uh, our NDF levels also up and down, but that can also depend upon uh, grain levels as well. Um, we started the BMR somewhere in the 2017, 2018 area. And so that might give you an indication of why NDF digestibilities have been, have been steadily going up. It's because of our increased use of uh, brown midrib in our forage mix on our corn silages. That, that doesn't differentiate between conventional and BMR. So our goal is to produce large quantities of high quality alfalfa and corn plants. First stage of forage quality is to grow the product, to get it to, get it to the high quality that, that you need. And we all know that over time our tonnage increases and our quality decreases as we let that crop mature. So we have to decide at some point how do we get maximum quality and still get enough tons. So after you grow this high quality plant, then you need to preserve it through harvest, storage, and feed out. Like high quality milk, which is always the highest quality as it leaves the udder, forage quality is always the highest right at harvest time before the harvester hits that plant. At every point after that, quality declines. So what can we do on our farm to try to preserve that quality? So we're going to first talk briefly about achieving through forage growth and quality. What are some of the things that we do in order to try to create a better quality plant? We select our seeds in the fall. Um, I'm not going to talk about specific hybrid selection because that's, that's a personal farm decision. We are currently using a Bravant hybrid that's 106 days of relative maturity. That's a very long maturity for northern Wisconsin. Um, the reason we choose that long maturity is because we are the last of four farms to have our uh, forages harvested by a custom harvester. When you're the last of four farms in corn silage and it takes a month for them to show up, you better have something that holds on. There was a time when we didn't have that and it always got dry. So we really tried to go to something longer day. We take more risk with that due to frost and other issues, but that's part of, the, part of the program. We put a lot of manure on our ground, and manure applications, of course, are important. The timings of that, mainly in the fall and the spring when it's time to empty the pits. Um, one of the reasons I bring this up, one of the keys to our forage production program, this may be not quite so much on quality, but it certainly is on the quality of the stand, is we apply a lot of manure onto our alfalfa before we seed it down. It's the first thing right now that we're, that we're manuring once the crop is off the ground. They're hitting all the fields that had silage off that are gonna be seeded down to alfalfa. Most people wanna hit their corn uh, fields because corn is such a high consumer of nitrogen, of course. But we found that this young alfalfa seedling really responds to heavy manure applications prior to seeding. 
It's also been very useful to work this ground in the fall.
nice to do a study where you looked at the, over time, at the beginning of the harvest of that crop to the end of the harvest crop, and how much variability do you have in that quality during, during that day or two that you're harvesting that. And because of the equipment that we have today, that quality has become so consistent over time. It's made managing our haylage piles so much easier because we know what we're gonna get. I remember the days of seven days to harvest and, and all of that. One of the components that helps with, with working with my nephew on this is that he allows me to tell him when do we go, how fast do we go, what do we chop first, second, third. Typically it's in the order of cutting, but it isn't always that way. And so he lets us set the pace, and that's been really helpful. Um, not going to spend much on inoculant time on inoculants. We do inoculate our alfalfa, but we do not inoculate our corn silage. I'm going to have to move along here. We currently are store alfalfa in, in bunkers that we go over the top of. BMR corn silage is in a pile with one wall here and one wall that's buried because we hide high, uh, heifer corn silage in the middle. We added to our bunker uh, about three years ago. We only had what's indicated here as year one. And so we would fill feed off the uh, front and we'd end up with problems because we had to keep feed, uh, we could only feed from this side. And so we had to feed fresh material and we had no fermented carryover. We went and added another side to this. And so now we flip from side to side and I have at least four to five months of carryover um, of the corn silage. I mentioned that our, our production is, is higher in the fall now than it used to be. This is why. We, we don't have the fall corn silage slump because we're always feeding that uh, fermented material and four months is, is a nice number to go with. In our bunkers, um, we store the alfalfa. Um, we put all four cuttings in the same bunker. And if you're gonna do this, that means you gotta move tires. And the workers don't always like this, but you have to cover and uncover, and cover, and uncover, and cover, and uncover. But that's the cost of trying to decrease the footprint of your pad and to put it all into a smaller space, and a bunker allows you to do that. Um, I'm not saying it's the best, it's, it's, it's what we do. Because of that, we have to feed green material uh, for a few days, but it does allow me to really decrease that footprint on the farm. When you're storing material in the bunkers, this is, this is our preference. Anybody that's pushed haylage up knows that it doesn't flow for a darn. It wants to clump up and it's, it's difficult to push. The, the recommendation is, is of course to put layers on and, and pack in layers. And, and, and I agree with that for the most part. But one of the things we really strive to shoot for is create a bowl in our bunkers. You got to create a bowl here. You never fill to the middle. You always fill to the sides. Because when you fill to the sides, the packing tractor can put his tire right on the wall because he's leaning in. He's not leaning out. And so that tread is right on the wall. So you can notice we don't use any plastic to line that wall. We don't really need to because it's packed tight as a drum as we try to maintain that bowl all the way up. When we're using that articulated tractor to push this material, it doesn't get to the wall by itself. It doesn't just fall off the blade. You have to take that tractor and push it into the wall by turning the blade and run right into the wall with the whole pile. You'll end up with eight feet of material right there. But by the time you pack it down, of course, It'll be where you need it to be. So that's where we don't layer so much is on these sides, but we can get these walls packed by leaning in. Storing in the bunkers, the operator of the pushing tractor controls the pace. He is the king. He is the most important person on the farm at that time is the guy in the push tractor because you cannot force him to go faster than he can get that job done correctly. 
After he pushes that up, we try to just put as many pack tractors on there as we can to pack it down. To cover this, uh, most people won't do this, but I do. I'll take a fork on the top of that bunker and I'll hand shape that bunker. You've got to get the bunker material off the wall so the tires sit there. You've got to try to get rid of some low spots. You've got to blend that out. You want that dome to be as flat as you can so that you get that sheet of plastic as tight as you can. Um, I'll skip all the rest of that, um, except here. Always got to make sure there's double rows of tires at any place that oxygen can get uh, through on the walls or on the seams or at the front edges. Piles are much easier to use, especially corn silage piles. The goal here, as quick as possible. Here, the pushing tractor does not control. If you need more pushing tractors, you just put in another pushing tractor because we have way more room. That's the advantage of a pile. There's more physical space to get that material up in. The harvest dictates the speed. We let them go as fast as they possibly can. We just simply get more pushers and packers to get the job done. And we find that as that pile gets bigger and bigger, you just, we just never have enough pack and tractors or enough people to operate them. I, I do have a couple packer operators in the audience today, and I want to thank you for your help this, oh, what was it, three weeks ago, we got it all in. Um, and when we uh, cover with... Uh, our, our big piles, we use the widest roll of plastic that, that we can find. We currently use 100 by 1,000 sheet rolls. I think those are the biggest anymore. They, can anyone tell me different? I think 100's as wide as you can get. The advantage of really wide rolls is, of course, fewer seams. And the fewer seams, the less oxygen you get into that pile. What are some of your enemies when you're storing this stuff? Obviously, air and water. Our biggest challenge right now is the vermin. And that's what all this, all this is caused by over here. Um, primarily the rats that, that you get in your feed piles. They create a lot of holes in the plastic and the air and the water get in. Wind, but you can do something about the wind. You just have to really protect your edges. You can't do much about the cattle. Um, Cattle got out last night at 8 o'clock when I was trying to get this done. And so <laughs> we, in the dark and the rain, we were putting cattle back in. And of course, some of them ran on top of the pile and put holes in the plastic. So you've got to see what you can do to get those, get those repaired. And right now, my slopes and my walls and my seams, those, those are just my biggest enemies uh, in terms of air and water. So... If I had my druthers, and you have a copy of this, this is what my feed storage would look like, and we're trying to move towards this direction. I'm gonna go with one common wall to separate the alfalfa and the BMR, so it's not a bunker, it's two piles, but I share a common wall, so it's a little bit smaller footprint. I have it sloped one way and the other way, and then the other direction, it's also sloped that way, so the water completely sheds, regardless of the year, when which direction you're going. Um, and I wish we could do that today, but that's not what we got. So during feed out, I'm just going to quickly run through this. Feed out is critical because you do it every day. You only store in the material a couple days during the year, but you can control quality of feed out every day. I'm going to tell you what you do and you're going to disagree with me and that's fine. Our alfalfa, the size of the face is such that we remove about nine inches per day. However, on our BMR corn silage, we're moving only about four inches per day. I used to take slices down that corn silage, you know, do a third and then a third and then finally a third. And there were some huge issues with that because of the face that you would, you would leave behind. I had water issues. Since we switched to increasing the face size, and taking the whole thing at once, it's been so much easier to uh, harvest and fill that bunker to cover it back up, to keep the water away from the face. So there's been a lot of benefits from that. One thing I've learned on these big open faces is that it's not the temperature that gives you the problem, it's, it's the moisture. Um, as long as it doesn't rain, you can leave that face open for two weeks. 
even when it's 90 degrees, as long as it's not super humid. The moment it rains, it's going to turn moldy on you instantly. So you really have to monitor the face based upon the moisture that you're getting on that face rather than what the actual temperature is. When we do have rain issues, we just, we just have to take a much smaller slice off that face and try to remove as much of that per day as possible. Plastic removal, we remove much smaller amounts when the weather is warmer, little larger amounts when it's, uh, when it's cooler. We, we, do, we do the cardinal sin. I will remove plastic and the face is so big that my face will be uncovered for almost 10 days before we get through it all. But it's, it, it's, it still seems to work. Tire management on that face, these must be two rows and they must touch each other. If it's anything less, air is going to get through there on a 60 mile an hour wind. So you've got to maintain that. Um, and we also work really hard that if we do have any spoiled material on top, and it's only going to be on top, uh, is removed before it's fed. We don't use a facer, but we do use a grapple bucket, and it, it slices the material so it's a relatively flat face. Since I'm the feeder and I have to do this very quickly, I find the facer takes too much time. Also, when you face it, it creates a loose corn silage pile that's hard to pick up. Um, and my grapple speed is, is really fast, so that's why we stuck with that. Work real hard to clean up any loose feed because that will get hot. You've got to get rid of any loose that's on the floor. And keeping up plastic and tires uh, just sets a good precedence for the whole farm to keep the place looking decent. One thing to control from a quality standpoint is not all feed is the same. There's going to be higher and lower qualities. The shoulders are always poor quality in the haylage piles because there's a little moisture that ends up on the top of the shoulders next to the wall. Next to the wall. You don't feed that to milking cows, you feed that to young stock. So we try to allocate by quality, saving the best quality to the milking cows as much as possible. We also will adjust moisture on the fly. Um, I mix one TMR for the entire lactating herd, um, and each batch is the same size. So a batch in the mixer is going to look like this every time. If the moisture levels go up, it's going to look like it's a lot less because the volume, of course, is less. And so we adjust based upon volume in the bucket and volume in the mixer after we've had a rain event. Once you've gotten past the rain event, then you can go back to going strictly based, based on weight, which is what the standard is, of course, is feeding by weight. And it doesn't do any good to feed and produce high quality forages if your mangers are dirty. So obviously we clean the mangers every day. We'll power wash them once in a while. And if I need to, I'll clean them by hand with a shovel to get that sticky gummy crap off the bottom. You all know what we're talking about if you feed cows. Uh, you've got to have a clean surface, otherwise all the high quality doesn't mean anything if they smell that stuff coming through the feed. A few challenges in the winter. We have a lot of snow. We generate a lot of what I call snow feed. If you feed cows and animals in an open manger and the snow is on it, they don't eat it. What are you going to do with all that snow feed? We can't afford to throw it away, so we'll put it back in the mixer, dump it on the floor, and then we'll, we'll blend it out with the heifers over the next two or three weeks so we use all that snow feed up. You have frozen feed. Huge problem in corn silage when that face freezes. How do you break up that face? A facer can do that. We don't use a facer, so we got to knock it off and we got to drive over it to break up those forage chunks. Uh, you can't feed corn silage sickles because they won't eat them. So somehow we gotta break up that frozen forage. There's also an issue of maybe having forage too cold to feed to the rumen. Um, there's not a lot you can do about that um, unless you wanna heat your forage up. Um, removing spoiled forage is very difficult when it's frozen. You'll have frozen material on the top, but the top will be froze. 
And so how do you get the frozen stuff out there, out of there? That, that can be difficult. And finally, if you're feeding corn silage and even haylage in the dead of winter and it's 20 below out, you can't see the face because of the steam that rises up off the face. So that can be a, a challenge in trying to get a clean face, getting the quality where you want it to be. So in conclusion, quality is a team effort. However, there are as many ways to do this as there are farms that just shared with you some of the things that we do. But at the bottom line, I think it's important to try to control what you can control and what you can't, like weather, maybe rodents. You can try to control some of them. Other factors you have to let go. Thank you for your time. I'm wondering if we...